Now for your forecast first, WRBL News 3 First Alert Weather. Clear and cool tonight with temperatures dropping in the 40s. 44 degrees right now. Now that the storm system has cleared, we're kind of in a transitional period until our next storm system arrives as we get into Friday. But overnight, it's going to be cool. You can see some clouds do build in as we get towards daybreak uh, tomorrow morning. Temperatures falling in the upper 30s. But we're talking about a rain-free day for your Thursday. Showers and storms are back Friday. Potential for severe weather on your Saturday. We'll break it all down coming up in that first alert forecast. You're watching WRBL News 3 on your side. Straight ahead, Troop County investigators find a missing piece of a 45-year-old puzzle. The latest from a cold case investigation into the disappearance of an Auburn University student. Next, months of debate and 10 maps later, a Columbus Commission approves new district lines for the next decade. We'll break down the changes ahead. Plus, it was a trial that captivated the nation. Now, Scott Peterson is in court once again, nearly 20 years after the murder of his wife and unborn child. News 3 Nightwatch starts right now. On your side, this is News 3 Nightwatch. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for trusting News 3. I'm Teresa Whitaker. A new discovery in a 45-year-old cold case is leading Troop County authorities on a search for new answers. News 3's Amanda Peralta has the story. 22-year-old Kyle Klinkscales vanished into thin air on the night of January 27, 1976. He was a LaGrange native who was studying at Auburn University and working at the Moose Club, a lounge off Old Airport Road in LaGrange. Klinkscales disappeared that Friday night, leaving few clues and little hope behind him. 45 years later, his car, a white two-door 1974 Pinto runabout with a Georgia tag, his wallet and human remains believed to be his, were found in Chambers County, Alabama, off County Road 83. We retrieved the vehicle out of the creek, uh, was able to tell that it had a Troop County tag on it. Once we were able to tell the Troop County tag was on it, I then reached out to Captain Nathan Taylor, gave him the tag number and the VIN number, to attempt to try to find the information on this tag. Klingscale's parents spent years searching for their only son and even wrote a book titled Kyle's Story, Friday Never Came, The Search for Missing People and created a nonprofit missing person organization, Find Me, Inc. Officials say his mother's biggest wish was to find her son before she passed away. His mother, Louise, passed away this past January. Hopefully we'll find something we may never know, but we are glad today. You know, Ms. Klingscale, his mother, died just this year in January and it was always her hope that he would come home. It was always our hope that we would find him for her before she passed away. So just the, the fact that we have hopefully found him and the car brings me a big sigh of relief. The car was transported to the Troop County Sheriff's Office where the GBI will be investigating the contents of the car. This is the creek where officials located Clio Kingstill's car, leaving them searching for answers regarding his disappearance. Reporting in Chambers County, Amanda Peralta, WRBL News 3, on your side. Previous news coverage indicates two people, Jimmy Jones and Jean Johnson, were later arrested on various charges connected with Clink Scales' disappearance. Those charges include concealing a death and making false statements. For more details about this decades-long investigation, you can head to WRBL.com. Meanwhile, in Columbus, police are asking for help locating a man missing for over a month. Police say 31-year-old Javier Alejandro Hernandez was last seen November 4th on Young Avenue. He's 5'1 and weighs about 170 pounds. Take a look at your screen. Police say he also has sleeve tattoos. If you have any information on his whereabouts, you are encouraged to contact Columbus Police. Keeping our eye on Columbus as we take a closer look at the vote over the weekend to approve new district lines for the next decade. News 3's Kenzie Beach joins us now with a breakdown of what the changes could mean for Columbus residents. Kenzie. Teresa, after 10 different maps were presented to the Columbus Redistricting Commission over the course of five meetings, the vote was 15 to 1 for map J, which you can see behind me. 
Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge and her team adjusted the district lines according to the 2021 census data. Using that data, the goal is to draw each district so that population and demographic numbers fall within a target range, all while trying to keep neighborhoods intact. After the last meeting, the concern was for the final map was with the demographics in District 8, which covers West Central Columbus. They fall short of the ideal population and demographic benchmarks. That district and District 5, which also covers a portion of Central Columbus, stand to change the most with the new proposal. Here's what the councilors representing those districts had to say. I lost East Highlands or a big portion of that, and uh, that did hurt a little bit just because I've really, I've, I've given a lot of time and effort to help in that area, and uh, the residents there have been so good to me, they're like family. It doesn't matter whether you live in my district or not. I'm a counselor for everybody, and I'm a counselor for everybody who lives in this town and every constituent. District 5 Councilor Charmaine Crabb tells News 3, quote, the commission was very thorough and conscientious with the job they were set out to do. And yes, I am satisfied with the new proposed district lines, end quote. The maps have been sent to the Georgia Legislative and Congressional Reappointment Office for approval by the state. Again, these maps were drawn based off of the 2020 census data. After that, the Columbus City Council will vote on the map. Teresa, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Kinsey. More information about the new districts, including an interactive map showing how the changes will affect your area, is available on WRBL.com. We're following other developing stories this evening in Minnesota. Opening statements began today in the trial of former police officer Kim Potter. Potter is charged with manslaughter in connection with the shooting death of 20-year-old Dante Wright during a traffic stop. A defense attorney told jurors Potter mistakenly pulled her handgun instead of her taser, adding she did what she had to do to protect her partner. Prosecutors argue Potter had undergone extensive training that warned about such mix-ups. Potter told the court she will testify during the trial. And out in California, Scott Peterson has been resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He was sentenced to death in 2004 after being convicted of killing his wife Lacey and their unborn child, a case that gained national attention. Last year, the California Supreme Court overturned Peterson's death sentence because they found some jurors were improperly dismissed. Peterson continues to maintain his innocence. As we head into the break, we want to thank you again for trusting News 3. Coming up, as the Omicron variant spreads to more U.S. states, the Biden administration is cautiously optimistic about the current weapon against it. We'll explain after the break, but first, let's check in with Cody. All right, we'll take you out to the Phoenix City Amphitheater camera tonight, and it's a little bit on the chilly side with those temperatures in the 40s right now, waking up to temperatures in the upper 30s, and we're talking about the rain coming back in this forecast with the storm system for this weekend. We'll talk about it in that forecast coming up. News 3 is on your side with Teresa Whitaker, Phil Scoggins, Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswald, and Sports with Rex Castillo.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 Night Watch. More than 200 million Americans have now been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but as the Omicron variant continues to spread, health officials are recommending Americans roll up their sleeves for another dose. Natalie Brand reports from the White House. The Omicron variant has now spread to more than 20 states, but of the several dozen Americans infected so far by the new strain, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky says nearly all of them have become only mildly ill. She told the Associated Press that most were fully vaccinated, but new numbers released by Pfizer show two shots may not be enough. However, the lab study revealed a booster shot increased protection 25 fold. That's really positive news that it can blunt the infection, no hospitalizations and hopefully no serious illness. The booster shot could be the answer to the challenge that we're facing with the Omicron. Pfizer said just two doses should still prevent severe disease or death. President Biden cautiously welcomed the report. That's a lab report. There's more study going on. But that's very, very encouraging. Even with record numbers of Americans now getting a booster, only about a quarter of eligible Americans have had one. Just as COVID hospitalizations jumped nearly 30% in the past month, driven by the Delta variant. Here on Capitol Hill, President Biden's vaccine mandate for millions of American employees is facing opposition in the Senate. The joint resolution is passed. Democrats Joe Manchin and John Tester joined with Republicans to support a measure to block the vaccine or test requirement for private businesses. The move is largely symbolic since the measure is unlikely to get a vote in the House. But the president's vaccine mandates are facing multiple challenges in court. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, Capitol Hill. You're on the Night Watch and there's more news ahead. Cody is going to have your first alert forecast coming up for you in about three minutes. Hurt by a big truck? 1-800-CALL-KEN. One call, that's all.
on your side. Meteorologist Cody Nickel has your first alert forecast. Welcome back. Temperatures right now in the 40s. We have 44 degrees in Columbus. We have some low 40s for East Alabama. Still hold on to uh, some mid to upper 40s across Cuthbert. The, the temperatures tonight are quickly cooling off. We have lack of cloud cover, and you can see that with the temperature change. Uh, some areas uh, 10 degrees plus uh, uh, colder tonight than what we were uh, last night. And uh, overall, we're going to be watching uh, some potential for fog to develop as well. When you have clear sky, the temperature and dew point are within three degrees. You can get some fog to develop, and that's why we have a dense fog advisory on the Georgia side, except for, uh, uh, let's see, Clay, Quitman, and Randolph counties. Everybody else on the Georgia side is uh, under that dense fog advisory through tomorrow morning. So lack of clouds tonight. That's why the temperatures are cooling off, but clouds will start to come back tomorrow afternoon as this boundary that moved through today kind of lifts back up as a warm front. It's really just going to bring the moisture back with it as we go throughout uh, the day Thursday, but overall Thursday is going to be rain free. Maybe late in the day uh, around midnight into Friday is when the rain starts to slowly make its way back in the area. Friday is just going to be somewhat of an overcast, mostly cloudy off and on dodging showers. So uh, you'll need the rain gear once again as we get uh, get ready for Friday around six o'clock. You can see off and on showers. The rain may start to taper off as we go throughout the evening hours, but overall we're gearing up for this uh, strong cold front that's going to push across the southeast for Saturday. You can see around 11 o'clock Saturday, it's still off towards the west. Uh, it'll be moving into our area after the lunch hour, into the afternoon, potentially early evening. Uh, depending on how much heating of the day we get throughout Saturday will depend our severe weather uh, potential. But we're going to be talking about damaging winds, isolated tornadoes will be possible as this moves through. So Friday and Saturday is really our only uh, two days to see some rain before that front clears us out into Sunday and Monday, but overall tonight going to be a little on the chilly side. 38 degrees clear and cool. Calm winds may let a few areas of some patchy fog develop, but overall tomorrow uh, it's going to be uh, partly sunny, more sun in the morning than as we get into the afternoon and evening uh, time. The clouds will start to build back into the area and then in for, uh, for your Friday, off and on showers with the warm front weather aware for the severe weather setup for Saturday across the southeast. Temperatures are going to be in the 70s and then that cold front does cool us off into the 30s and 50s by the afternoon for Sunday and next week. Teresa. All right, thank you so much, Cody. News 3 is proud to recognize our hardworking local educators with the Kinetic Credit Union Golden Apple Award. This week's recipient is a math teacher from Fort Middle School in Columbus. Sierra Brooks accepted her Golden Apple from WRBL's Carlos Williams and Kinetic Credit Union's Clint Perkins. She was nominated by Jennifer Thomas, who says her son went from doubting his smarts to making the honor roll. All thanks to Miss Brooks. I had the privilege of teaching him last year when we were hybrid. Um, he was one of the students who came in. He was eager to learn, so I am very grateful to know that I am having a lasting impression on my students. Congratulations again to Miss Brooks. If you know a deserving teacher, head to WRBL.com and fill out the nomination form. Well, stay with us here on the Night Watch. Just ahead, the thousands of Americans suffering from long-term COVID are now finding the help they need as the healthcare system deploys new treatment options to solve a wide range of symptoms.
WRBL News 3 in partnership with Valley Healthcare System presents Health Watch. Thousands of Americans say they're suffering from long term COVID. It's a problem that's prompting healthcare workers across the U.S. to create new comprehensive treatment programs. Dr. Malika Marshall reports. Didn't really understand. In March 2020, 47 year old Phil Bezeski developed fever, a cough, and trouble breathing. When the 47 year old father of four went to the hospital, the doctor didn't mince words. He said, You're really sick, and if we don't put you on life support, you're going to die. Phil had COVID 19, was in pulmonary failure, and given a 10% chance to live. He spent 28 days in the hospital, 16 of them in a coma. From when I woke up till the day I left, I mean, it was, it was a struggle to even just use my hands to feed myself. More than a year later, Phil still suffers from nerve pain, weakness, fatigue, shortness of breath, anxiety, depression, and brain fog. It's another pandemic, and it threatens the health of a generation. Dr. Bruce Levy at Brigham and Women's Hospital says up to 30% of patients with COVID, many with only mild illness, have at least one symptom that persists for three to six months or more, a condition referred to as long COVID. Long COVID involves multiple parts of the body, multiple symptoms. And so going to any one doctor is a real challenge to comprehensively evaluate this. That's why the hospital established a COVID recovery center where patients have their lingering symptoms addressed all in one place. They get a, an itinerary for any uh, doctors or other care, health care providers they'll be seeing. Phil has been coming to the center for a few months. It's provided me with some hope for the future that, you know, this is what I've been longing for from services, to have someone that really can understand COVID. He hopes more long COVID patients can also find the help they need. Dr. Malika Marshall, CBS News, Boston. Ahead in sports, the Carver Tigers have finally punched their ticket to the state championship game in Atlanta this Friday. Teresa, this trip to the championship game ends a 14-year drop. We'll hear from the newest generation of Tigers that hope to bring back a state championship to the Fountain City. That's next.
other side, sports director Rex Castillo and WRBL News 3 Sports. After 14 long years, the Carver Tigers are heading to Atlanta to fight for a state championship. The last time the, tar the Tigers made it this far, Del McGee led the charge and Carver brought home a state title to the Fountain City. Fast forward to 2021, it's Corey Joyner in his fourth season as Carver's head coach, who's led the Tigers this far. Every year since Corey Joyner and his staff arrived on campus, the Tigers have gone further and further in the playoffs. That also translates to this team's seniors. They've been through massive tests, like a double overtime game against Cairo in 2019. In the season opener, they played 6A powerhouse Lee County. And this postseason, they've had to come back in every game for a win. Carver understands the magnitude of Friday's title game, and they all want to finish the mission. It's important for the city, it's important for our school as well. So, you know, and it's important for us because we have put the work in. And we, we're not just a team that's been working one year, we're a team that's been working for four years for this project. I'll say this is a great, one of the great accomplishments that I really want to accomplish, like ever since my freshman year, and it would be a great way to end my high school career. I mean, it's been hard. A lot of hard work been put in, a lot of teamwork been in. I mean, we just stuck together as a team, played that one on Friday night. Carver squares off against Benedictine on Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. Eastern for the Class 4A state title. Up in college football, Georgia Hick football coach Kirby Smart was named the SEC Coach of the Year by the Associated Press. Smart led the dogs to a perfect 12-0 regular season record. Georgia was anchored by that historic defense. UGA held opponents to just 6.9 points per game. Now, before the SEC title game, that was the fewest since the 1986 Oklahoma Sooners held opponents to just 6.75 points per game. Sticking with college ball, the Crimson Tide will send Bryce Young to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. But teammates believe there should have been at least one more. Sophomore linebacker Will Anderson, who leads the country in sacks at 15 and a half, was not named a Heisman finalist. Meanwhile, Michigan defensive lineman Aiden Hutchinson, who is second in that category, will head to New York for the ceremony. Anderson says he has nothing to prove, but his teammates have his back. I have nothing to prove to anybody. It's all what I do. Nobody expectations higher for me. Nobody standards going to be higher for me. It's all about what I do and the expectation I have for myself. So I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing this whole season. I definitely think he was deserving. If you look at, you know, you look at numbers, you look at the production. Um, I definitely think he deserves to be there. Um, you know, it's. It's unfortunate that he's not going to be able to be there. You know, that, that really sucks, but I definitely think he should be there. The Heisman Trophy ceremony will take place on December 11th. And finally, the annual Sports Visions Football Wars Luncheon kicks off Thursday afternoon. Former Carver Tiger and Georgia Bulldog DJ Jones hosts this luncheon to honor some of the best local high school football players in the Chattahoochee Valley. They also have a special guest of honor as Alabama head coach Nick Saban will be chosen to speak with all the coaches and players involved. And of course, your News 3 sports team will also be presenters for individual awards throughout the luncheon. Other head coaches like Kirby Smart and Dabo Sweeney were guests of this event as well. That'll do it for sports. But Stick around, there's more news through coming up right after this.
All right, here's a final check of that forecast tomorrow. 65, partly sunny, clouds increasing throughout the day. Mostly cloudy to overcast for your Friday. Showers return off and on. Not going to be a total washout, but we are tracking the cold front. A severe weather setup potential for your Saturday, and then we are clear and sunny after that. All right, thank you so much, Cody, and thank you for watching News 3 Night Watch. Good night, everyone. Sleep well. Carol Black with their cast three, cast four, and fantasy five night drawings. First, let's play cast three, your first number. is two. That's followed by six, and our final number is three. Your numbers again are two, six, three. Good luck. Time now for your cast four numbers. Your first number is two. That's followed by seven. Then we have one, and our final number is two. If you have two, seven, one, two, and any winning combination, congratulations. Now Fantasy Five. Tonight's jackpot is $125,000. Our Fantasy Five numbers are six. Up next is 12. That's followed by 31. Then we have 10, and our final Fantasy Five number is 26. Your numbers are six, 12, 31, 10, and 26. Here are your Cash for Life winning numbers, 16, 25, 45, 48, 55, and the cash.